So I'll wait till, uh, okay, cool. Uh, this is session two of the Indwelling Life class, and the title of this session is The Indwelling Spirit. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to John chapter 16, verse 7. And uh, we're going to talk today about, uh, continue on our teaching about the indwelling Holy Spirit. And it's, it's really, this, this scripture verse is one of those scriptures which I would say this scripture verse is stunning. I got my daughter's attention because it, it's actually pretty funny. I, uh, as we're turning to uh, John chapter 16, verse 7, a couple months ago, the, uh, the ladies, or not the ladies, we had a 10 o'clock in the morning prayer meeting here, and um, the uh, Anna, who's, if, Anna is, uh, if you're listening online and don't know, Anna's 14, Evan is 13, and then Ellie is 11, and so they were up here, they were bored, and so they got the microphones, and they were imitating, they imitated me preaching, they imitated dad preaching, they imitated John preaching, and they imitated Michael preaching, and then also Randall preaching, and so um, to start off with, especially if you're watching online, you may not realize this, but a lot, we, we, when we do our worship, we turn the lights off, and so a lot of times dad will come up, and the lights will still be off, and he always gets up there, and he's like, you know, I can't see anything, so I think it was Ellie, or Anna or Ellie, one of them were like, okay, I can't see anything, turn the lights down, you know, and then the next thing they said was, uh, dad is known for his fundraisings, and someone got up, we, we've already raised $60,000, but that's not good enough, we need to raise $15,000 more, yeah, and actually, he's going to talk about that in a minute, so, and then they got to John, and, and John, Anna was doing John, and Anna said, now, John's famous, his famous line, now I come to my favorite part of my, the entire message, the end. And so she, she said that. It's funny what kids pick up on. And then Evan got up and was imitating Randall, and he said, okay, 10 years later, you know, meaning that Randall sometimes talks long. So, and then they got to me, and Anna, just like she nailed me, she got up, and she was like, you, you throwing her hands everywhere, and... And she, she kept saying, stunning, it's stunning. And, I, and I, I really had no idea that I said the word stunning so much. I know my hands flap everywhere, but I had no idea that, that I said the word stunning so much. And Anna was like, the soul, the inward soul. And I was like, no, Anna's actually the spirit. But I, I know, just, it was just really funny the way kids pick up on your little characterizations. But the, the main thing Anna was saying to me was, was I was saying, she was always saying, this is stunning, this is stunning. And what was funny about that is I had just written a chapter in my book, which is this, this session, and one of the, the titles is The Stunning Advantage. And I was like, you know, I actually do, I, I do say that word quite a bit. And it was funny because Dad reviewed it, and he's like, yeah, you might want to not say the word stunning so much. So I didn't, I had no idea. I had no idea that I said the word stunning so much, but what I'm about to tell you really, truly is stunning. This is what I'm about to tell you is really stunning, is Jesus has gathered the disciples together, and he tells them, he says, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage. Think about this. This almost seems like this can't be true. It is to your advantage that I go away. What? These are the guys that walked with Jesus for three and a half years. They witnessed him walking on water, turning water into wine. They witnessed him doing incredible miracles, restoring the, the, the hearing of the deaf and the sight of the blind and healing the lepers and all these incredible miracles, feeding the 5,000. And you would think, okay, there must have not been anything better than to have walked with Jesus for three and a half years. I mean, I, I, wouldn't that be incredible? I mean, just the encounters with demons and the authority by which he preached with. I mean, all of us would be like, man, that had to be the the apex of spirituality to walk with Jesus for three and a half years. And the Lord is saying to them, no, it is more of an advantage to you if I go away. You're like, oh my goodness, I can't even, 
uh, I can't even fathom that. That really is stunning. So it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Do you realize this? This is where I really want to get us to. What you have on the inside of you, if you're born again, if you're truly born again, if you truly have the spirit of Jesus Christ in your human spirit, then what you have and the reality you have is more advantageous than the disciples had when they walked with Jesus for three and a half years. That's, that's stunning. That really is stunning. That's almost like, Lord, are you exaggerating? You really, really, okay, Lord, do you really, really mean that? That is an amazing statement. Basically, it's best that I go away. It's for your good that I'm going away. It's to your benefit that I'm going away. I mean, like, Lord, I think it really points to, uh, to, to us and to our heart that we don't fully realize to the extent we need to realize, and that's really the, the, the goal of this message, of who dwells in us. Paul said that if, you're, if you belong to Christ, then the same spirit who raised Jesus Christ from the dead now dwells inside of you. That's amazing. I'll use a different, i use a synonym. That's amazing. I mean, incredible, all inspiring. I don't know all the synonyms for stunning, but that's amazing that, that God himself dwells in you, that we have it better than the disciples did for three and a half years when they walked with him. And I can tell just saying this, if you're not shouting hallelujah, you may not have a revelation of what I'm talking about. It might just be mental knowledge. But the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead now dwells inside of you. Your human spirit, you know, we talked about last, last week that you, are, you have a spirit, you have a heart, you have a soul, you have a body. That your human spirit is now one spirit with the very spirit of God that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Your very spirit, if you're born again, is one spirit with the very spirit who created the heavens and the earth, the universe. Your spirit is joined to the Holy Spirit. And Jesus talked to the disciples and he told them, he said, the spirit of truth will be in you. So you just got to love the way the Lord's heart was. And in John 17, 26, he's praying that the love with which you loved me, Father, might be in them. The same passion and fire that you loved me before time and creation might be in them. And then he ends that prayer and he says, and I in them. The passion, the desire of the Lord Jesus Christ to dwell within the spirits of the redeemed is beyond words. His desire to dwell within you cannot be stated with human words. It's beyond words. It really is stunning. His burning desire from eternity past was to be inside of you, to be one spirit with you. You literally cannot be closer to Jesus Christ than you are in your spirit. You are, your, your spirit is connected to him vitally and intimately. He's closer than your skin. That, that is incredible. You know, I love the fact that during Christmas, you know, the focus is on Emmanuel, God with us. And I love that scripture in Isaiah, Emmanuel, God with us. But there's something greater than Emmanuel, God with us. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
That is far greater than God with you. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And I am convinced, I am convinced that the reason why we struggle, the reason why the church is living in defeat, the reason why we continue to struggle with whatever it is, lust, selfishness, criticism, judgment, whatever it is, cold love, whatever it is, you struggle with the reason why we keep going in circles over and over and over is because we lack a revelation of the one who dwells in us. Now, you might be able to quote the scriptures. You might be able to preach this message better than me. Probably you can. But I'm convinced that there is a massive gap, there's a massive difference between knowing this in your head and knowing this in your heart by having mental knowledge and having spirit revelation. The reason why you keep spinning your wheels and going nowhere, I would say nine times out of ten, is because you don't really know who dwells in you. And may God break us out of the boxes. May God break us out of the boxes, of the, of the mental boxes we put ourselves into that we might break out of that and come into the, the authentic revelation of the one who dwells inside of you. Christ in you is the difference maker in your life. But if you don't know he dwells in you, it will not make any difference in your life. You will continue in your anger issue. You will continue in your lust issue. You will continue going around and around and around with no change and no transformation until you really realize Christ dwells in you. And I, I'm, again, I, this is, you know, most of you would go, amen, I, I, amen, I know that. But I would challenge us and say, mental knowledge, mental knowledge and spirit revelation are vastly different. Even the, even the devils know the scriptures and can quote the scriptures. So what I'm talking about is not a mental apprehension of facts and information. I'm talking about a spiritual perception that comes by the Holy Spirit transmitting light into your human spirit and your, the eyes of your heart are opened and you have that aha moment where you realize, oh wow, Christ lives in me. The very spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells on the inside of me, and nothing is going to accelerate your spiritual progress faster than if you know that Christ dwells inside of you. I mean, it's the difference between joy and sadness. It's the difference between selfless, selfless, selfless love and selfishness. It's the difference between peace and anxiety. It's the difference between hope and despair. It's the difference between purpose and aimlessness. See, so much of the church is just stuck in this mire of living so far below what God wants us to live because we don't know Christ lives in us. But yet when we discover that, it changes literally everything. And I can say that, I can say that in my own experience is when I truly got a revelation of Christ in me, it changed everything. A revelation of Christ in you is the difference between knowing Christ intimately and knowing or and merely knowing about him intellectually. That 18-inch gap between your head and your heart is the difference between, it makes a difference between everything. Is that God might give us revelation to know that we know Christ dwells in us. Now, one of, the, one of the, the craziest things to me in Scripture, not craziest, but pretty, pretty crazy is 
if you read the book of Corinthians, you realize, okay, the Corinthians, the Corinthians were operating in the spiritual gifts. They were prophesying. They were, they were speaking in tongues. They were interpreting in tongues. They were healing. They were doing miracles. They were doing all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And yet Paul comes to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and he says, you are carnal. You are men and women of the flesh. You are acting like mere men. And, you know, even though they could move in the gifts of the Holy Spirit and they were very familiar with the external manifestations of the Spirit, they were unaware of the internal residence of the Spirit. And therefore, because they were carnal, Paul said to them, Do you not know? I mean, I can just imagine Paul, Paul writing to them, and he's like, guys, this is so bizarre. You're operating in all these gifts and all this power, but you're full of jealousy and envy. You're into immorality. You're still practicing idolatry. You're still doing all of these things. Guys, do you not know who dwells inside of you? And he asked them, and he, I love this, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 3, he says, you're acting like mere men and women. How much of the church today is behaving like those of the Edemic race, not knowing they are a new creation in Jesus Christ, from the simple fact that they know in their head, but they don't have revelation in their heart, of the one who dwells in them? And they're acting and they're living from soul life, self-life in their soul. They're living by the cravings of their body and not by this inward source of divine life, indestructible life, dead-raising life, created life that is now joined to your spirit, spirit to spirit. The very life of God is in you but you're living from the soul. You're living from self. You're living from the cravings of the body. Paul, I believe if he came and spoke to the American church, he would say, you're acting like mere men. Do you not know that you are a new creation in Jesus Christ? The very one who raised Jesus from the dead is dwelling on the inside of you. See, the problem with the Corinthians, the problem with the Corinthians is they did not know. They were familiar with the external manifestations of the Spirit. They were familiar with the, the external outpouring of the Spirit. But they were ignorant of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Paul says to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, verse 16, he says, Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? And I believe Paul would ask, that very question to the American church, do you not know who dwells in you? And us Americans, we're very good about mental apprehension, mental, mental cognition. We're great about facts and information. And if we would be like, Paul, of course we know that. And we would list out all the verses. And Paul would look at us and say, I'm not talking about head knowledge. I'm talking about a revelation an eye-opening revelation of the surpassing greatness of the power of God that is at work in you. I'm talking about the very same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that ascended him into heaven, that sat him at the right hand of God, that gave him the name above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee would bow on heaven, in heaven and on earth, and made him head over the church. That's the kind of power I'm talking about. Do you really believe, do you really, I'm just saying, Paul would be like, do you really expect me to believe you know, really know that when I look at your life and you're living in defeat, you're being defeated by self-centeredness and lust and bitterness and unforgiveness and unbelief and you're stumbling and going in circles and you're going everywhere you're, go, you're spinning your wheels but going nowhere. I, you, the same problem you had five years ago, 10 years ago, 30 years ago, you still have today and you expect me to believe that you really know God dwells inside of you? 
And I believe he would ask that to the American church. He would ask us to us. Do we know God dwells inside of us? Do we have a personal revelation of this truth? See, one of the problems we have in America is, and it, it, you know, we've got a lot of problems. One problem we have is this nation was born out of the age of enlightenment, the age of reason. And so the way the Greeks were in terms of acquiring wisdom and mental knowledge has that kind of mindset is so inbred into the DNA of America that we, and we carry it into the church, that we think having mental cognition of a fact or information means we really know it. And yet the, the Greek word for know, when Paul challenged the Corinthians and he says, do you know, do you know, do you know? He wasn't talking about mental cognition or intelligence or information gathering or being able to quote scriptures or preach a message about it. Paul was using the Greek word ido, which means to know by perception. And perception is really tied into intuition. He's really getting into what we talked about some last Sunday is, is that, that you know that you know, not here, but here. You know in your spirit, and your spirit has come into an experience of this where you have seen and you have perceived. This is what this Greek word means, to perceive with the eyes or by any of the senses to discern. It, it, it's really getting on to this, this knowing that comes by perception, this knowing that comes by intuition, this knowing that comes out of experience, a knowing that comes by revelation. And so Paul was basically saying that have you come into this, and uh, Ido, Ido means a full knowledge that comes by perception, experience, and revelation, not by mental knowledge or intellectual understanding. And so when Paul used, when Paul said in Ephesians 1.18, he says that I pray for you, that God might give to you a spirit of wisdom and a spirit of revelation. That word spirit, if you look at it, is lowercase because Paul's not talking about the whole, giving you a whole, the Holy Spirit who's the spirit of wisdom and revelation. He's talking about your human spirit having and receiving a spirit of wisdom and revelation. In other words, the Holy Spirit who is connected to your human spirit transfers to your human spirit wisdom and revelation here. And you, you can read this in Ephesians 1, 17 through 19. And that revelation transmitted to your human spirit, not, my, not mentally but intuitively to where you know in your spirit, then becomes like light that opens, that shines into your heart, and the eyes of your heart are opened to you know that you know what God has given you. And, that, and that, that's, really what, that's really what Paul's getting at. Do you know in this way? And, and you know, I, I wrote the book about it. I'm teaching about it. I need to go deeper in this. I don't want, it's so easy to just go, you know, just, you know, one of the challenges that I've, I've had in, in writing this class, reading this, writing this book, I've read this stuff, I've read my book like, 160 times it feels like and you know just typesetting and editing and trying to get it exactly the way it wants is it such knowledge in me I don't want that knowledge to limit me from the inward experience of it see what we're talking about here is experiential knowledge the knowledge that comes out of experience have you experienced this in the Lord in your prayer times with the Lord to where you know of the indwelling Holy Spirit and the one who lives in you. See, when we're talking about trying to live the abiding life, ignorance is a hindrance to you abiding. And I would say even ignorance in terms of just having mental understanding, mental cognition, mental awareness, that is a hindrance to you to abiding. And a lot of times what happens is, is you can read the scriptures, you can hear the message about it, and that, that American mindset kicks in and you go, oh yeah, I know that. Oh yeah, I've heard that. Oh yeah, I've I preached about it or I've taught about it. I've sung about it. And you can think, okay, 
because I, have, I know it here, I've got it here, I've experienced it, it's actualized in me as life, and therefore you think, okay, because I know it here, I block out my ability to press into this deeper, and therefore it limits me from the abiding life. You see where the, that knowledge can be such a hindrance in the American mindset? that it, this is all about life, this is all about experience, this is all about revelation, experiencing the indwelling Holy Spirit. I want to read, let's read uh, Ephesians chapter 1. I, even though I just quoted, I want to read it again. Just even at the risk of repeating myself, just to, just to let it sink deep inside of us, let it go deep, deep, deep inside of us this prayer, and I would encourage you to pray this prayer over your life as much as you can because don't ever, let's not ever mis make the mistake that, oh, I, I prayed this one time and therefore I know. I, have, I find myself, I, I forget things so easy. I forget who I am and what God has done in me and who dwells in me so quickly. I've got to remind myself over and over and over. So that's why I would encourage you, pray Ephesians 1. Um, 16 or yeah, 16 through 19 as much as you can. I'll start with verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom. Again, lowercase because he wants to give it to your human spirit. Basically, the, the Holy Spirit who dwells in you wants to transmit wisdom to your human spirit. The Holy Spirit who dwells in you wants to transmit wisdom revelation to your human spirit in the knowledge of him and the true and the precise knowledge of him that comes out of relational experience. That's what that word means. And I pray, this is what we need, you, I would encourage you to pray. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. You have eyes in your heart. You have eyes in your heart. And those eyes need to be enlightened. They need to be opened those internal eyes need to be opened so that you can know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And then verse 19, I love this. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us, or you could also say in us, who believe? The surpassing greatness. See, the, the church of Corinth did not know. The church of Ephesus did not know. I would say the Church of America does not know the surpassing greatness of his power in you and then because it's in you, towards you when you believe. And how do you believe? You believe when revelation comes into your heart, opens the eyes of your heart, and you see it. And you go, oh, I did not, I knew it, but I didn't know it. Pray that prayer. Pray that prayer regularly. See, a lot of times people get confused about who the Holy Spirit is, but the Holy Spirit is God. The indwelling Spirit is God. He's the third person of the Trinity. When scholars and Bible teachers use the term indwelling Spirit, they get this from Romans chapter 8, verse 9. This is where the term indwelling Spirit comes from. As Paul said, the Spirit of God who dwells in you. And so scholars, theologians, Bible teachers now use the term indwelling Spirit to refer to the Romans 8, 9, the Spirit of God who dwells in you. And Paul even says in that verse that if you do not have the Spirit of Christ, you do not belong to him. And so the litmus test of whether or not you're truly born again, whether or not you've truly been converted, whether or not you're going to heaven rather than hell, is not if, if you attend church, not if you love Jesus, is not if you, you know, said a prayer, whatever, when you were younger, is do you really have the Spirit of God in you? If you don't have the Spirit of God in you, then no matter what prayer you prayed or no matter what you've done, your good deeds can't do anything. You, you, you must have the Spirit of God in you to truly be born again. I believe that's why, you know, the reason why so many of our churches in America are filled with, with people, and yet they have no impact and no life change because they're just trying to 
They're not really have not been born again. The, the spirit of the living God does not dwell in their spirit. You must be born again. And so obviously this, this class is under the assumption that you have been born again. If you have not been born again, if the spirit of Jesus Christ does not dwell inside of you, then you must be born again. But when we think about the Holy Spirit, it's vital that we don't think of him as an it or an impersonal force. We don't think of him as a, a, a dove or oil or fire. He is like a dove. He is like oil. He is like fire. But he's God. He's, he's fully God. The indwelling spirit who dwells inside of you is fully God. You have God inside of you. I mean, think about that when you go to work tomorrow and you're sitting next to people and they don't have God and you have God on the inside of you. That is incredible. You have God on the inside of you. God is in you. God is in you. you you're different than the, the majority of the people because you're a new creation. God dwells in you. You know, wherever you go, God goes with you. So we probably should remember that when we get mad at, like, the grocery store or salespeople. I need to remember that. We're talking to customer service, you know, all that stuff. We have God inside of us. I'm speaking to myself. We have God inside of us. When things don't work right, you get frustrated, God is still inside of you. Let him live in you and through you. He is the indwelling Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the indwelling Spirit has a mind, a will, and emotions. There are scriptures in the notes that you can go back and read those. The indwelling Spirit speaks, teaches, can be grieved, can be insulted, can be quenched. The Spirit of God, the indwelling Holy Spirit of God in you is fully God. And the indwelling Spirit is the difference maker. Because he's the only one that can enable you to live the abiding life, know Christ intimately, and produce fruit for God. You cannot produce fruit for God. You cannot live the life God wants you to live. You cannot. It is impossible for you to live the life God calls you to live apart from constant yielding to the indwelling Holy Spirit and letting him live in you and through you. You cannot be made ready as a bride for Jesus Christ. You cannot overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil apart from him living in you and through you. He's the only one that can do it. You can't do it. That's freeing. But it should not be an excuse for passivity or complacency or apathy. It should, be, it should move us and motivate us to say, Lord, okay, I want you to live on the inside of me I pray like Paul said in Galatians 2.20 that Christ would live and not me. Christ would live and not me. The indwelling spirit is Christ. John 14.16, uh, the Lord said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That word another in the uh, Greek is allos, which means another of the same sort. It's like if you were going to use allos, there's, there's two words that mean another in the Greek. One is allos, one is heteros. Allos is another of the same sort. Heteros is, is another of a different sort. So if you were going to say, okay, if a Greek-speaking Greek person was going to talk about allos and heteros, say, if you wanted to give an example, they would say, okay, if you have an apple and you want another apple, you would use the word allos. If you had an apple and you wanted an orange, they would use the word heteros. It's another of a different sort. And so when Jesus comes and speaks to us in John 14, 16, he says, ask, I will ask the Father. He will give you another helper, another, of, as, as, another as the same kind as me. And, and just like when, when Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, the same is true. If you have the indwelling spirit of Christ in you, you have Christ in you. The Holy Spirit who dwells in you is Christ. The Holy Spirit who dwells in you is another of the same sort as Christ. He's the third member of the Trinity. He is Christ. He is the Spirit of Christ. He's also the Spirit of the Father. And so, you know, we talked about this at the introduction that when Paul was praying for the Colossians that 
that the mystery that had been hidden for generations and millennia, that mystery of Christ that was now being made known to the, through the prophets and apostles after the resurrection of Jesus, that the great eternal plan of God is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The angels didn't see it. The prophets and the patriarchs, for the most part, didn't see it. That Christ in you is that great eternal plan of God. So now that you have the indwelling spirit, now that you have God in you, Christ in you, you have the Father in you, it's the, it's the spirit of God in you, it also means you have life in you. And that's where we get the title of this class, Indwelling Life. The Spirit of God who dwells in you is life. He is life. He is the life of God in you. He is the indestructible life. He is the uh, overcoming life, the resurrection life. The life of God is now in you. You now have two life sources from which you can choose. Self-life that is in your soul. I want what I want when I want it and how I want it done. That's self-life in your soul. Most Christians live from self-life in their soul. They don't live from the indwelling life of Jesus Christ, either by ignorance or by choice. They, they, they don't live from that life source of Jesus Christ in them, and therefore very little fruit is being produced in the church. But God would have us change that, that the primary and the only life source we live from is no longer self-life in the soul, but in dwelling life in our spirit. And so if you look up the, in the New Testament, if you get on like blueletterbible.org and you type in the word life and you look in the New Testament for the word life, here's what you're going to find. Here's some examples of what you're going to find is you're going to find that Jesus Christ is the bread of life. Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. Jesus Christ is the word of life. Jesus Christ is the light of life. And the Spirit of God that dwells in you is a life-giving Spirit. See, you have a life-giving Spirit that dwells in you, and He wants to give life to every single fiber of your being. He wants to permeate and saturate and fully possess your spirit, your heart. He wants to permeate your soul, your thinking, your emotions, your choices. He wants to even give life to your mortal body, that body we looked at in the last session that is dead because of sin, that has sin at work in its members. God wants to give that life that is in you to work itself out all the way outward until you produce fruit. It's like it talks about in Isaiah is that um, the remnant would, would go down deep I'm quoting and misquoting it, but they would put their roots down deep and they would bear fruit outward. That's, that's the life God has called you to live, is to put your root system down deep and bear fruit upward. Still talking about life in the New Testament, John said, the Son has life in himself. The Son gives life to those who believe in him. The Son wants to release His life in fullness to those who yield to Him. And the Son's life in you is a well of water springing up to eternal life. You have a river of living water on the inside of you. You have rivers, Jesus said, that those who believe in Him from their innermost being, that's talking about your spirit, the deepest part of you, that innermost part of your being, that innermost part of your being, you have a river of life. You have a well of salvation. You have the, the life-giving Spirit of God. That, that life-giving Spirit of God would flow out of you as a river of life to a dark and a desperate world. That life is in you. Paul said that the Son wants to become your life. Paul said the Son wants to live His life through you and in you. And Paul said, the Spirit wants to empower you to walk in newness of life. See, this life that is now in you, every time we, you, in most of those cases as we looked at, the word life is the Greek word zoe, which is God's life, the superlative life, the higher life. Uh, 
is a higher life form than what, what we know as the suke life, which is the soul life, the self life. It's a higher life than bios, which is the animal life. It's the, it's the God's life, the indestructible life, the life that God the Father and God the Son possess in themselves by God the Spirit. That life is now in you. That Zoe life is now in you. Now, let's look at John chapter 10, verse 10. I want you to see this for yourself here and really ask, okay, I'll ask myself, okay, Brian, do, do you really have abundant life flowing out of you? You know, ask yourself, do I really have rivers of living water flowing out of me, the life of Christ flowing out of me? Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy, but I came... That's bringing us up to God's eternal purpose. Jesus came. The purpose, the reason he came was that he might give you life by dwelling inside of you. I came that you may have life. That life is not just something that is external. It's a life you possess in and of your, in, in yourself, in your spirit. Because the life-giving spirit is now in you. I came that they would have life. And here's what I want to challenge me with and challenge you with. Is that you would have that life abundantly. You would have that life flowing out of you to such a degree that it's like a river of gushing water to the world that is desperate for answers and solutions and hope. See, okay, you might have life, and you might have life in you, but is that life possessing you, and is that life flowing out of you in abundance? I know for me, I need the Lord to release more of his life in me and through me. I need for, for him to increase and for, Christ, for uh, self to decrease. But I want you to get this vision of what Jesus came for. He came for not just to, you to have a trickle of life, not just for you to bear a little bit of fruit. God came, Jesus Christ came, that he might put his very own Zoe life, the very life that could not be contained by the grave, the very life that raised Jesus from the dead, that indestructible life of God on the inside of you. He came to put that life into your human spirit. But it's not good enough for that life just to stay in your human spirit. The life must be released. If it's to have any good, it can't stay suppressed. Most Christians suppress the indwelling life of God in them through selfish, soulish, carnal living. Self-life in the soul. I want what I want when I want it. And they don't yield to the indwelling life of God so that he might flow out of them like a river in abundance. The fullness of Jesus Christ is available to you if you want it. The hindrance is you, not him. The hindrance is me. Not him. Me still living. Me still wanting what I want when I want it and how I want it. Me still the life source I'm living from. Self-life still the life source I'm drawing from. May God change that. As we approach the second coming of Jesus and the bride being made ready, may we change that to where we would have the life of God within us without measure, without limitation, in such fullness that it gushes outward and it permeates every single facet of our being, from our thinking, our emotions, our choices, everything in our body, that the light, we would be overflowing with the very indestructible, dead-raising life of Jesus Christ that created the universe. May his life give life to our mortal bodies, that abundant life Jesus came to give you. And so as we bring this message to a close, 
the application for you, I want to challenge you, I want to encourage you, is to pray that prayer in Ephesians 1, 17 through 19. Pray that prayer. Just spend two to three t days this week praying that, Lord, okay, give me a spirit of wisdom and a spirit of revelation. Show me the surpassing greatness of your power in me and towards me who believes. See, I just want to just spur you on a little bit. Ask yourself this question. Are you stunned? Here's how to tell if you have a revel Here's how to tell if you have head knowledge versus revelation knowledge. Are you stunned, virtually speechless, by the wonder of Christ, the eternal Son of God dwelling in you? So are, are you stunned by that? Are you stunned? Does it, does it take your breath away? Are you at a loss for words because you realize God, the eternal Son, through His Spirit, dwells inside of you? Does it shock you? Does it make you just, I don't even know what to do. I don't even know what to say. When revelation comes, and I'm not exaggerating this, when true revelation comes, when you really get that revelation, your eyes are opened. God dwells in me. Christ dwells in me. The same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of me. I see it. It's, and I don't mean to repeat myself, truly stunning it's truly stunning. And if you have that revelation, has that revelation knowledge transformed the way you live? See, do you have that revelation and has that revelation transformed the way you live? Because you can have the revelation, but you can still make the choice to live by self-life in the soul and that self-life in the soul, what it does, it suppresses that indwelling life of Christ so that it's not released in you and through you like sap through a branch to produce fruit. And so if, if self-life in the soul is still the life source you live by, the fruit you are going to produce is going to be the fruit of a soulish carnal life. The, the fruit of the flesh, the deeds of the flesh, Paul talked about in Galatians. You can read about it in Galatians chapter 5. The lust and idolatry, immorality, factions, jealousy, envy, witchcraft. I mean, you can just go through anger. You can go through and look at all of that and realize, okay, that is the fruit that, that comes forth when self-life in your soul is a life source you live by. But when Christ is your life and you allow that revelation of the one who dwells in you to then be released outward in that abundant life Jesus came to give us, then your life will be transformed and everyone around you will see the difference. You know, and so if you can't honestly answer yes to both of those questions, and probably none of us can, including me, then it's my hope that we will seek the Lord in prayer for that, for that greater revelation of the indwelling spirit. To say, God, would you, please, uh, would you please remove the limitations in my thinking, remove the limitations in my religious mindset, remove this idea that because I have knowledge of it, can quote the scripture of it, I've heard the message 15 times or 150 times, that, Lord, I would not think that knowing it in my head is the same as living it and living by it and having the experience of it by perception and revelation that truly, Lord, you might bring me into that place that my eyes would be opened to see the surpassing greatness of his power in you and toward you who believe. That power in you, that power that surpasses, you know, like Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3, that, that it goes beyond what you can think, ask, or imagine. You ought to read it. Ephesians chapter 3, I think it's verse 20, 320. That God would do something exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all that you can ask, think, or imagine. How? By the power of of Christ, and then Paul says this in that verse, in, that works mightily in you. It's not, I'm not saying there's not times when God's power come, doesn't come upon us. There is times when God's power comes upon us. 
But Paul is stressing in context that power that is in you. See, this is some, some people will go, that's just like self-help psychology. You're just trying to get people to tap into the power in themselves. This is not about the power in themselves and the self-life. This is about the power of Christ who is in you. This is about Christ, not about yourself. This is about Christ who now is grafted to your human spirit. It's about Christ who is now fastened to your human spirit. It's about Christ that's now glued to your human spirit. So there is no disconnection between you and Christ in your spirit. There is none. You are not far from God. You are not disconnected from God. You might feel that way, but that, those feelings are just feelings. They're emotions that are lying to you. You, are not, you. you cannot be closer to God than you already are in your spirit. The problem is all this other activity of the soul is you're allowing that to live instead of allowing this inward part to govern and rule your life. And it must bring the soul into submission that Christ who is life might live in you and through you and that unto fullness and that unto the abundant life so that you might bear fruit, fruit that remains, much fruit or more fruit, much fruit and fruit that remains, the fruit of the abiding life that is in Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Lord, we just, we thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord, for that incredible, incredible, Lord, just, I know we joked about this, but help us to be stunned. Lord, let us be stunned. Let even the kids that were making fun of me in a good way, let them be stunned. Let us be stunned, Lord, at the incredible, awe-inspiring revelation Lord, we pray of Christ in us. Lord, that we would give our heart and our soul to the indwelling spirit of Christ, who is life. And that life might fill us, possess us, permeate us, flow outward in us, Lord. I pray that we would have, Lord, a distaste for the soul life, the self life, the limiting, the limiting aspects of self-life, soul life that we easily, all of us, me included, easily succumb to day in and day out. Emotions ruling, the mind ruling, the will ruling, the desires ruling, the motives ruling, self-life ruling. That, Lord, we would come into that experience, Lord, of the Spirit of God truly conquering and living in us and through us, Lord. Bring us deeper. Bring us deeper, Lord, into the revelation, I pray, in the name of Jesus, Lord. Amen.